So um, we're going to be reviewing pediatric non-accidental trauma this morning. We have a couple of objectives. We're going to be discussing epidemiolo epidemiology, sorry, uh, particularly in Brooklyn, um, and then reviewing some of the suspicious injuries that we should um, be aware of. And then kind of once you've arrived at that diagnosis or that concern, what we should do both clinically and I guess socially with everything else. I just wanna, before we move into everything, thank the PEM team, particularly Rosie and Dr. Khan for all of their help with this lecture because it took me a long time. <laughs> so um, just a little bit of the epidemiology. I know this is not everyone's favorite to start off with, but um, non-accidental trauma, just to start, um, refers to any injury that's induced by physical abuse or neglect. And actually this is like more than 1000 kids die from this every year. Um, it's a little bit of a heavy topic and some of the images that we're gonna see are not um, nice to look at just so everybody is warned a little bit. Um, but actually, so in 2010, it was about um, two out of every 100,000 kids died actually as a result of non-accidental trauma. And it occurs in all ages, but generally it would be between zero and about two or three years old when kids are less able to defend themselves. Um, in 2010, actually, the government, the U.S. government identified almost 700,000 cases of first time child abuse. And that was in addition to over 700,000 uh, like repeat victims, repeat offenders. And so actually, if a child sustains one injury, like a sentinel injury, and they go back to that same abusive environment without any intervention, they're very much more likely to sustain, you know, escalating injuries in terms of severity and frequency and fatality, actually. Um, and actually about 30% of kids with abusive head trauma in one study, they kind of missed the diagnosis of non-accidental trauma. And then of those kids, 30% later died from this. And so it's really, really important just to keep this on the differential. Um, and we all know that it's a little bit more common than we thought, um, at least for me. So this is coming from Brooklyn from 2012. Uh, actually in New York state, there were over 170,000 cases of child abuse reported to the state. And about 30% of those were substantiated as, I guess, an appropriate concern. Um, this map is kind of, like a heat map of um, ACS and child welfare cases based on neighborhood. And so you can see us, we are somewhere around here, I think, which is this I'm assuming is Prospect Park. So we are here, our hospital would be serving this community. Um, so you can see that it's a little bit darker, this area, and then for example, above the red line, it's also darker. And so we know from where we work and we know from kind of just the population of New York City, kind of the demographic makeup of some of these neighborhoods, there's a lot more black and brown people. It seems like actually that they're bearing a disproportionate impact of child welfare investigations. And so I bring this up not to say that we like shouldn't be reporting this to ACS because we're mandated, but I just want everybody to be aware that this is the community that we're working in and there actually is not a proven racial risk factor for child abuse. If you control for income, it's the same. And actually white families are more likely to kill um, their children from non-accidental trauma. And so I just want everybody to keep this map in mind as we move through the lecture because we serve a very predominantly Caribbean and Caribbean American and African American population. That doesn't mean anything really in terms of their risk for non-accidental trauma. There's actually risk factors that are divided up kind of three categories. Um, risk factors that are specific to the child, um, risks that are specific to the perpetrator, and then also to the family structure or to society. Um, so if we do it in terms of child-based risk factors, um, male children are actually more likely to have fractures and also to die kids that are between zero and two years old, um, younger kids, firstborn kids, um, children with disabilities are also more likely to be victimized. Um, in terms of perpetrator 
risk-based risk factors, they're actually more likely to be young female single mothers. Um, but if it's a male perpetrator, it's more likely to be fatal. And then in terms of family structure and society, um, again, single parents, um, but also lower income households, households that struggle with substance abuse. And actually, interestingly, stepchildren are also more li likely to be victims. So whenever you're concerned, um, you really need to nail down the details of the family structure, actually, and the history um, in the parents. Not that it's very pleasant to ask, and you can kind of help or at least have your social worker help to facilitate that conversation if you're in the room together, maybe, but you do need to know. Um, so just a couple of things to be aware of, and I know we talked about this with some of those board review questions this morning. So some of it will be review, um, some of it won't. Um, all of these things listed here are really important to do your thorough evaluation if you're thinking that this could be from non-accidental trauma. Uh, particularly bruising or any sort of multiple injuries in the different stages of healing, or if you recognize any patterns, whether it be from fingers, different instruments, which we will go over soon. Sorry, this is like hard to get through because it's so, it's just like very emotional. Um, this is a mnemonic that you can use, which actually was also covered. Um, any type of bruising in these patterns, so the 10 faces, uh, 10, four faces P is coming from ASAP or EMRA, but anything on the torso, the ears or the neck is very suspicious. Anything less than four months old, um, anything um, involving the frenulum, angle of mandible, cheeks or eyelids, and then subconjunctival hemorrhages, very concerning. And then any patterns, which we will talk about a little bit. So you're gonna need to pay attention to the bruises in particular. Um, are they bruises from just bumping into like the corner of a table or are they bruises from something? For example, fingertips, teeth, which is a really important one in the corner here. Um, uh, maybe like a belt buckle, a spoon or an iron, like a burn in that pattern. Uh, and cigarette burns actually, which we'll see a picture of later. Um, so when, are there questions up to this point? Yes, Olivia, that's okay. Yeah, so for those of us on Zoom who maybe didn't hear that, um, Olivia was saying that um, even if someone's coming in for otalgia, something that may not be related, it is important to do um, a complete physical exam and undress the child so that you can really look everywhere. So when should we be suspicious for child abuse and non-accidental trauma? Um, basically, any concerning injury or any concerning story, you're gonna wanna go through very, very carefully in terms of witnesses, timing, location and mechanics, and then the child's reaction. And then kind of correlate that and make sure it makes sense with the developmental milestones, which we went over a little bit, but we'll go over again today as well. So anytime you're concerned, you need to kind of separate the, child, the children from the parents, separate one or both of the parents if they're both there and interview them separately. Um, and actually interview them all multiple times because if the history is changing or different people are kind of giving you different details that don't really add up, then it's concerning. And then again, if the history doesn't really explain the injury, um, it doesn't correlate with their development. And then this bottom bullet point here, um, implausible, inadequate, or inconsistent is like, a, I don't know, I like the vocabulary and it helps me remember. <laughs> um, in terms of witnesses, again, you're gonna wanna interview the adults separately 
and compare the details. Ask them specifically, what do you remember from the beginning, middle, and end of this event? And then ask them again later, you know, and have the social worker ask them again. It's not like an interrogation. It's just collecting data and making sure that it makes sense. Um, you're going to want to take siblings, if they're present, and interview them also away from the caretaker and from the other kid. And then again, in terms of the developmental milestones, just ask the parents or ask the older siblings, what does this kid like to do? You know, what do they play with? Who do they hang out with? What do they do at home when they're maybe by themselves? Is that appropriate for the development? Um, in terms of timing, when did this occur? And what injury actually occurred? And then when did symptoms develop? So did the kid fall? kind of bump into their head, maybe on the ground, and then immediately cry, and then immediately was normal. Maybe that's not non-accidental you know, non trauma. Maybe he just tripped, and this is like, a, you can use that PCARN rule, maybe not need to do imaging and discharge them. But if they develop lethargy or vomiting later, or later they seize or syncopize, then you need to be concerned for some kind of more severe intracranial injury and potentially non-accidental injury. So what are the mechanics of the event? So at least last time I was in peds was maybe like a week or two ago, and there's a lot of really wiggly kids, but you need to know what the kid actually does when they wiggle at home. Were they twisting and they maybe were they sitting on the couch and they like fell forward? What did they strike? Did they hit their head? Did they hit their arm, their leg? Um, did they hit the floor? Did they hit a table? Did they hit like a block or some plastic toy on the ground? These are all really, really important things to ask. And then again, what did the kid do immediately afterwards? Which kind of goes along with the symptoms, but you want to know kind of along with this, did this just happen or did the parents wait two days? You know, that might be a little bit more concerning if there's a delay in seeking attention. So this is a little bit of a busy slide. But there's a lot of very suspicious fractures, and we'll go over just a couple. Um, anything sternal or rib is obviously very concerning, unless it's, I guess, like a high-speed MVA. And again, if you just, the parent tells you they fell and they have posterior bilateral rib fractures, that's very concerning. Any kid who can't walk shouldn't really have a femur fracture or a finger fracture. Um, any kid less than three with a humeral fracture is very concerning. Um, complex skull fractures, obviously, um, and then spiral fractures. So we will talk a little bit about a couple of these. Um, just one other thing. If you see fractures in like multiple stages of healing, you know, one that's new and then one that you pick up on the x-ray where it was like maybe a couple months ago and then the parent tells you, oh yeah, they did the same thing then maybe you should raise your suspicion a little bit. But in terms of these two that are highlighted, spiral fractures are classically taught as a sign of potential child abuse, but that's actually not the case, which I really wanted to highlight here today as well. So it can be specific for child abuse, but you have to ask about the development because if the kid just learned to walk, it's actually pretty common that they kind of twist their leg and then fall. And then they can just get the spiral fracture because. Here you can see the mechanism, kind of like the twisting and shearing mechanism, which would give you that spiral shape fracture in the tibia. It's actually common in that, in kind of like a, around one year old, one to two years old when they start walking and running. Um, it's called a toddler's fracture. It doesn't mean that they're being abused, um, but you should still do a complete evaluation. And then in terms of bucket handle fractures, this one is more pathognomonic for child abuse. So you can see here and here, it's, it's, uh, it's called a bucket handle, um, kind of like a metaphysial avulsion fracture, basically in any lung bone. That's pretty um, pathognomonic because it suggests actually a shaking force back and forth particularly in kids who are less than two because they can't really defend themselves and they can't really like necessarily move their limbs away. Um, so this would be the mechanism again and you would get kind of that avulsion fracture. 
if you see one of these, then you have to be very suspicious and you should probably consider doing like a head CT, getting ophthalmology because if they have a shaking mechanism and they're a baby, maybe they have like a subdural hematoma or some kind of hemorrhage in the eye that needs to be evaluated. So before we get to what's called the skeletal survey and the Kings County protocol, which we have a protocol, so you don't have to memorize it, which is great because there's a lot of details. Um, again, it's really important to know the developmental milestones. So by the time a kid is about four months old, they can generally roll onto their back, but they can't walk, obviously. So if a parent is telling you that they, I don't know, um, got their hand stuck in a door while they were climbing out the car seat, that makes no sense. Absolutely not. By the time the kid is about nine months old, they can start crawling, they can start standing. And then by the time they're one, they start cruising. So cruising is about the time when maybe you can see some bruising. There's a saying like, if you don't cruise, you don't bruise. <laughs> but if they're, if they're able to sort of help themselves get around like holding onto furniture, they can potentially bump into things and have some kind of bruising. But again, if it's in those sort of bizarre locations like the ear, you have to be very suspicious. Generally with bruising, even for adults, I think it's difficult to like bruise your own abdomen and torso and like the more central parts of your body. It's more easy to bruise your arms and legs. Um, just something to keep in mind that you don't have to memorize like all the specific locations. Um, by the time a kid is um, about 18 months old, they can generally walk. And then by the time they're two, they can usually run. So we kind of went over that, but around the time of maybe 18 months is when you might start to see um, a toddler's fracture, which maybe wouldn't be as suspicious for child abuse, although you should still do your evaluation. So again, some kind of concerning images, sorry, I forgot the warning, um, but there's a couple of extra suspicious exam findings that we should know about too. So this, um, you can see here, and maybe here, that there's a very linear demarcation of this burn. And then here as well, a very linear demarcation. So this is very, very suspicious for child abuse, particularly for like an immersion injury, or like a dip into hot water. Um, there's a couple other images here. So you can see something similar here where it looks like the child is dipped. And actually one pattern that I thought was kind of interesting is what's called the zebra stripe. So, Obviously we know from peds, babies have a lot of skin folds. And then as they get a little bit older, they start to become normal shaped. <laughs> it's difficult to <laughs> describe, but if they have a lot of skin folds, then where the skin is folded, you'll see that the burn is actually like sparing that area because the, the folded skin kind of protects the skin that's like within that fold. And so it wouldn't get a burn necessarily. But again, if there's a linear demarcation, it's very suspicious. These, are, these would be from um, cigarette burns. And this is um, the frenulum, which if you don't remember is that little thing kind of between your upper lip and your gums. Um, if it's torn in a, in a, especially in a baby who can't get around, it's very suspicious for child abuse actually because the bottle is being kind of forced into the mouth quite forcefully, so it shouldn't be torn. And then this would be just a cartoon of what you may see um, in a strangulation injury. So we've seen this in adults. I think there was a lecture maybe last year about this as well, but any petechiae in the face and neck is very concerning. And then as well as the kind of like subconjunctival hemorrhages would be very concerning as well. Um, and then obviously you may see bruising or kind of like a cord or road mark around the neck. Okay, questions up to this point. Yes, Dr. Khan. Yeah, so for thank you. For those that on Zoom that maybe didn't hear that, Dr. Khan said. Um, actually, if you have like forceful vomiting and retching, you can also get facial petechiae and maybe even subconjunctival hemorrhage. So it's just important to correlate those exam findings with your history. Okay, 
So if we have like arrived at our suspicion for child abuse and we have made that diagnosis, what do we do? So you got to report it. We are mandated by law to report this to ACS. So actually every step of the way, like every person who interacts with this child is, is like a mandated reporter as well. So the police, social workers, and us. Um, you're going to be doing a lot of this in conjunction with social work. I'm not sure if I've actually ever made the direct call to ACS myself, but I have been there to talk to the actual caseworker when they show up in the ER. Um, the most important thing is to ensure safety. Um, if you have a suspicion for child abuse and you turn out to be wrong, you're covered from liability. You're covered by Good Samaritan laws because you have to report any concern. And then in terms of the safety, again, your social worker is gonna kind of facilitate some of this, but if they have another family member who could maybe take the kid home or somewhere else that the kid could go um, while they're sorting this all out, then that is okay, generally. Um, and then we're gonna move into the skeletal survey a little bit shortly, but I just wanted to briefly talk about documentation. So if you are reporting a concern for child abuse to ACS, then your documentation is probably gonna become part of the legal record. And so it's really important to be very specific with what you're writing. I don't know that I would say like, this injury is pathognomonic for child abuse in the medical record, but you need to describe every single injury that you see. So you can just say multiple bruises, different stages of healing on the neck, the ears, um, or you could say fracture, you know, a bucket handle fracture in the distal humerus or proximal tibia. And that, because the medical kind of institution knows that those are suspicious, then it's okay. You don't necessarily have to call this child abuse. You could just say, you know, um, concerning injuries we'll discuss with social work, something like that. I, I don't know that I would pigeonhole myself and everybody else into putting that into the chart. So again, if you think about child abuse, you do a very thorough physical examination. And then if you're concerned, you're gonna move into a skeletal survey, including a head CT and potentially labs, kind of on the basis of the patient's age and the history and the, the findings. So a skeletal survey, um, it's actually, it's basically like a, the easy way to think about it is like a total body x-ray, but you're gonna basically be doing AP and lateral skull x-rays. You're gonna do um, chest, pelvis, and like vertebral x-rays. Um, and then bilateral um, humerus, forearm, uh, hands, thighs, legs, and feet. So it's essentially almost everything. Um, and generally you do this for any child less than two years old. And then after the age of two, it's kind of individualized. And then you need to also consider a head CT. So this is the Kings County protocol. Can you see that okay? Kinda, okay. So there's a lot of bullet points, but just to sort of summarize, everybody gets social work and ACS contacted. Everybody gets a trauma consult. And then anybody less than two years old so you can see here, it says less than 24 months. So everyone is getting a skeletal survey, which would be those x-rays that we talked about. Again, if you're calling trauma and potentially ortho, I don't know if you need to like follow up every single x-ray, but it's okay to order them from the ED and then have them follow up, like go to x-ray potentially and have them followed up upstairs. Um, any child less than six months gets a head CT. Um, and then basically everyone gets labs, including abdominal labs. The reason for this is because you're looking for elevated liver enzymes to suggest liver injury and also hematuria to suggest kidney injury. If you see those elevated LFTs or blood in the urine, then you're gonna scan the belly to look for an intra-abdominal injury as well. Um, and then there's a couple of extra labs, like particularly if you're thinking about intracranial hemorrhages or bleeding disorders. So, uh-huh. Mm. Yeah. Um, so doctor, for those who didn't hear, Dr. Khan says it's actually better to just let them complete the skeletal survey upstairs because if you order it, then you would be on the hook for the results and the management. Thank you.
Yeah, so for those that didn't hear again on Zoom, the question was, is there any data in terms of like how many clinically significant injuries we're picking up with skeletal survey? And Dr. Khan said that basically if you're concerned about abuse, that the benefit kind of outweighs the risk in terms of radiation because they do pick up a significant amount of injuries that they might not see otherwise. Um, and in, I just want to highlight in terms of like, so not everyone is getting an abdominal CT. It depends on the labs. And again, not everyone is getting a head CT. It's anybody less than six months old. And then um, I guess as an inpatient, if ophthalmology is consulted after the age of six months and they find something concerning, then you could consider doing a head CT from upstairs. But not everyone needs CT imaging. So in terms of outside resources, uh, this one is actually in the protocol as well. So if you look in the binder in the PZR, there's like a phone number for this, but um, the Brooklyn Child Advocacy Center is really helpful for a lot of these cases. Actually, it's like right by my apartment, <laughs> by the Barclays Center. Um, so you can refer to the um, uh, Child Advocacy Center with the phone number. You just need to be aware that they don't see necessarily like every single case of child abuse just because there's such a high volume. But they will kind of like do an initial evaluation and then make a judgment like, does this child need therapy? Does this child need extra resources to help them kind of recover from these events? So just briefly touching on sexual abuse and assault. Um, in addition to some of the things that we discussed, there's a couple of extra kind of historical and clinical findings that might clue you in that something is going on. So if the child has a decrease in school performance or behavior changes that are very atypical, or potentially is like displaying very sexual behaviors that are not appropriate for the kid's age, then you need to be suspicious. And in terms of GU complaints, um, that could be a presenting finding, but just to highlight that a lot of kids actually get like a vulvo vaginitis, which doesn't mean that they're being abused. It's actually common young age to have like a little bit of uh, problem with hygiene and they wear diapers so they can get erythema itching discharge and that doesn't mean that they're being abused you just need to correlate with history so this is the protocol from kings county for sexual abuse um, you can see over 13 you kind of follow the adult protocol and then younger than 13 um, you're going to follow the peds protocol um, the last contact has to be within 96 hours for the kits to be able to detect any evidence um, it's a little bit busy, but essentially, if the child has consented or the family and the child have consented to HIV post-exposure prophylaxis, you're going to be sending a couple of labs because you need to check their liver function in particular over time. Um, and then you're going to be checking a pregnancy test, syphilis, hepatitis, and providing the um, treatments and post-exposure prophylaxis for STIs. So all of the weight-based dosing is in the protocol as well. It's just not up here because I you can look that up. But the follow-up is actually important. So obviously, first, we're going to tell our some of our faculty about all of these cases, but then we're going to um, set these patients up with the adolescent clinic if they're above 13. And if they're younger than 13, they can just go to their primary pediatrician. We also refer to um, child psychiatry or behavioral health, and then... If they're starting PEP, you can refer to infectious disease. So these are some of the references, just in case anybody wants a little bit more information. And then just to review, so child abuse and non-accidental trauma is actually unfortunately common. Um, thinking about that map, I think it's surprising and also not surprising based on what we know kind of, of like the way the world is today. Um, just important to always be professional but maintain a high suspicion if you do need to and make sure that you report. Um, you have to pay attention to all the details of the history and the physical. And then remember some of those pathognomonic injuries and any part of the history that doesn't really fit, you have to raise your suspicion. 
and refer. That's it. Are there questions? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 